you and we hope you will want to participate. Okay, we just got the message about the recording. Awesome. So is are we ready to get started? Okay, Mercedes, did you have uh, something? I saw that your hand was raised from the translation. Nope, okay, cool. So it's really awesome for me to be able to welcome our um, the first person up here on our agenda today. Jaime Contreras is an executive vice president of 32BJ. Um, he oversees the union's work in the capital area district. That's Washington, DC, Maryland, and Virginia. And as 32BJ is organizing in North Carolina and has um, growing in Florida, um, all that is part of Jaime's world. So welcome, Jaime. Uh, thank you, Lenore. And thanks, uh, everyone, for having me. And it's so great to see so many members and leaders and staff interested in this uh, very, very important topic. So, um, you know, today I have the distinct honor to introduce someone who really doesn't need a whole lot of introduction, although he's a, a new governor. Uh, but someone who is well known and loved by uh, Marylanders, um, a leader who in his first few months has already uh, fought for economic uh, justice in the state of Maryland by closing the financial uh, gap in the state. Uh, uh, just a few days ago, he signed into law a bill that will, make, that will set the uh, state's minimum wage at $15 by next January. Um, he is a champion who is dedicated to environmental justice and combating climate change, um, making uh, Maryland one of the lead states uh, to guarantee clear air, water, and land. Uh, Governor Moore uh, just announced historical, uh, a historical partnership uh, between the Maryland Department of Environment, uh, Environment and the Center for Global Sustainability at the University of Maryland as part of uh, uh, putting Maryland on a track to achieve 60% uh, uh, emissions uh, reduction by 2021, uh, by 2031, I'm sorry, and net zero by, 2020, uh, by 2045. Uh, Governor Moore has led the efforts uh, during uh, this uh, recent legislative session to pass a law uh, with the goal of achieving 100% energy supply by renewable sources. Without further ado, it is my honor to introduce um, our great governor of Maryland, Governor Westmore. Hey, SEIU, it's Governor Westmore, and it's my honor to welcome you to the Climate, Jobs, and Justice Summit. I am proud to be your partner in working to build a better state for all of us, while also addressing the issue of climate change. Because every day you're on the front lines, you're in the front lines of the essential industries that deal with the effects of climate change. And so when people ask me, they say, well, how does climate change show itself? My answer is simple, in every way. It shows itself in the air that we breathe, in the water we drink, in the resilience of the communities we live in. And no one knows this better than SEIU. Many of you are the first responders to climate disasters. Many of you serve in industries that support communities dealing with public health hazards caused by climate change. And you're not just dealing with the effects of climate change at work, you're dealing with them at home as well. And we also know that when it comes to the effects of climate change, it is not distributed equally. Communities of color and low-income communities are always the most vulnerable. So as governor, it is my mission to build a state where we leave no one behind. And how we address climate change is at the forefront of that mission. It's why our administration is working to address climate change in a way that prioritizes environmental justice and ensures that our workers are protected, respected, and paid. Because climate change is not just a challenge, it's an opportunity to build a green economy that provides our workers with pathways to work, wages, and wealth. We are moving to invest in clean energy industries and create jobs. We are moving to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 60% by 2031 and achieve net zero emissions by 2045. And we are investing in critical infrastructure to help lift all of our communities and secure our future. 
And you all know that SEIU is a core part of that future. So together, we're gonna to work in partnership to address climate change, to ensure environmental justice, to build a green economy where all of our workers can thrive. So thank you. Thank you for your leadership, now and always. And I'm proud to stand with you today, and I'll be proud to stand with you as we work to make this Maryland's decade. That is great. And it's one of the reasons why it's so important for us to have champions in government um, and to be active in politics. For those of you who are contributing to your local's COPE fund or in 32BJ, we call it American Dream Fund, that it makes a difference. Um, and for those of you who are not, check in with your local union about how you can be involved in politics because part of how we solve climate change is electing folks to government who are gonna actually do something and be allies and champions and see the connections between climate justice and economic justice, racial justice and justice for immigrant workers. So thank you Jaime for joining us today for introducing Wes Moore. Um, and now we have somebody from the White House, from the Biden administration, um, who's going to be joining us and speaking to us. And she spent some time earlier in the plenary session. Cara Carmichael is the Director of Federal Buildings at the White House Council on Environmental Quality at the, in the Executive Office of the President. Welcome, Cara, and um, the floor is yours. Wonderful, thanks, Lenore. Um, and thank you for inviting me to join today. Um, excited to be here. And um, most importantly, I wanted to thank each and every one of you for the tireless work that you put into promoting the welfare and equity of workers across our country. Your incredible efforts did not go unnoticed. Thank you. Um, in my brief time with you today, I wanted to cover two key points. Um, one, buildings are a really important battleground for the climate crisis. Your work every day, both working in buildings and working on buildings, plays a critical role to reduce impact um, and improve the health and well being of our communities. And second, while the climate crisis uh, can be overwhelming, I'm really optimistic about our future, and I'll tell you why. So my work at the White House is focused on making our federal buildings uh, more efficient and sustainable and reducing the climate impact of our built environment. And most importantly, doing this in a way that makes people healthier, happier, and safer. So this work, um, this work in our federal portfolio impacts not only the federal employees who live or work in our federal buildings, but also um, the surrounding communities and the building industry as a whole. So why are we focused on buildings? Um, stepping back a little bit, climate change is an issue that affects us all. It's not just an issue for environmentalists, red or blue, black or brown or white or otherwise. It's an issue that affects everyone, including labor unions and members like yourselves. Buildings are the foundations where we live and work and learn and play, and yet they collectively represent almost 40% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, also, our buildings are around for a very long time. So 80% of all buildings that, that are around us today, they'll still be here and in service in 2050. So yes, there's tremendous focus and we need to make sure um, any new buildings are built right from the start. But we also need to focus on how we manage and operate and clean and care for our existing buildings. Buildings are also a key nexus point for the clean energy transition. Uh, the efficiency of our buildings indicates how much power the utilities need to generate. And more and more, we're plugging our cars into our homes and offices. So how we manage all of these important energy transactions is, is a really important consideration for the future of how we build and operate our buildings. So what is building decarbonization? What is a net zero emissions building or a green building or a sustainable building? Um, these terms define buildings that meet our needs today 
without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So a decarbonized building um, or a net zero emissions building, um, it has two key characteristics. First, it's efficient, meaning it uses minimal amounts of energy to operate. And second, it's all electric, meaning it doesn't burn fossil fuels such as natural gas or fuel oil on site in the same spaces that we live and breathe. So building decarbonization is critical to reduce the impacts of climate change. Building decarbonization will improve the health, safety, well-being, and the quality of life for people in our communities. By reducing our reliance on fossil fuels, we can improve air quality and reduce energy costs for consumers and create more comfortable and healthy living environments. <clears throat> The impacts of climate change, they're disproportionately felt by people that live in disadvantaged communities, of, as, as we all know and have heard previously. Building decarbonization will improve air quality, both indoors and outdoors in those communities and reduce the costs to heat and cool buildings and homes in those communities. So I'm really excited and optimistic about the future for, for two reasons in particular. First, Building decarbonization presents a unique opportunity for us all. In 2021, the energy sector employed more than 7.8 million Americans. Build it, the building decarbonization industry is growing rapidly and it will continue to grow over the coming years, which means that there will be plenty of job opportunities available. And these will be good jobs with better pay that leverage the skills that are already present in our trades. In 2021, energy jobs grew faster than the overall US workforce. Energy jobs increased by 2.8%, creating close to 60,000 new jobs in energy efficiency alone. And it's a really important opportunity for equity. Data from the US Energy and Employment Report shows that there's a higher proportion of non-white workers in energy than in the overall US workforce. So 26% of workers in energy are non-white versus 22% across the US workforce. I'm also inspired by the ambitious vision and leadership from, from the federal government. With over 300,000 buildings, the federal government is the largest building owner and manager in the world, in addition to being the largest employer in the United States. So doing the right things in our federal buildings can drive much bigger change. And the administration is committed to tackling the climate crisis with the urgency that science demands. President Biden set a goal through the federal sustainability plan to achieve a net zero emissions building, federal building portfolio by 2045, including cutting emissions half in half by 2032, um, very aligned with Governor's Moore, Governor Moore's goals. This will be achieved by prioritizing energy efficiency and building electrification. Addressing climate change and environmental justice will affect not only the environment, but the social and economic well being of people, which is the main reason we do this work to better the lives of all people. So, in conclusion, everyone deserves access to live and work and play in healthy and efficient buildings. And I'm confident in our ability to meet this moment and reduce the impacts of climate change through our built environment. And union labor plays a critical role in making our buildings cleaner, safer, and more efficient. So thank you for the work that you do every day. Thanks, Kara. It's great to have you. I love that you said that buildings are a battleground for, for climate. Uh, we're a building, you know, we're the building workers in within SEIU world. And we, we're both on the front lines of the impact and also on the front lines of the solution. So we kind of see ourselves as climate warriors here in, you know, in leading and, and marching and pushing forward for just solutions to the climate crisis. So we're going to um, hear next from Local One about some of the amazing work that's going on and um, uh, in Local One land. And for that, I um, want to introduce Monica uh, to lead. Uh, Talby and Roberto Rodriguez, Local One. Let's have a big shout out for Local One. Thank you, Leonor, Lenore, for this warm uh, introduction. 
Uh, SCA Local One has been committed to environmental justice for many years now. After all, our members are the stewards of the biggest freshwater reservoir in the whole world, the Great Lakes, and we want to keep it that way. <clears throat> uh, Green Janitor Program has been on our radar from the moment it started in California, in New York, and we were ready to go and implemented the Green Janitor Program in February 2020. You all know what happened next. It took us three years to get going again, but in January of this year, we relaunched a green janitor program in Chicago's two main downtown buildings. One of them being Merchandise Mart, 4 million square feet of commercial space, building so large that it has its own zip code. Because we are Chicago, we are the city of big shoulders and we make no little plans. Uh, over a hundred members are enrolled in the Green Janitor pilot program. Every week, 10 classes are being conducted in three different, different languages, English, Spanish, and Polish. Training materials and exams are offered in five languages, English, Spanish, Polish, Arabic, and former Yugoslavian. As I talk to you today, we are just short few weeks away from graduation of our pilot cohort. And Ms. Kara Carmichael, I want to use this opportunity to invite you to come and visit. Building owners, building managers, and employers are equally in support of this program. Getting their staff trained on green cleaning practices helps them to keep or establish buildings LEED certifications, not a small or cheap fiat. In the currently very competitive commercial market, having a highly trained workforce might be the X factor that attracts, keeps tenants. What makes our Green Janitor program truly unique are our member instructors. That, are, that conduct weekly classes. They have to train on a curriculum and deliver in their respective languages. They established a true report with members and became experts that our members can connect with and discuss realities of the job and how to effectively implement uh, green cleaning techniques. I'm proud to present to you Roberto Rodriguez, one of our member instructors, who will tell you more about his role and experience. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Roberto. I'm a member and a union steward at Northwestern University. I've been working as a janitor or in the janitorial field for the last 16 years. I'm one of the instructors for the Green Janitor Program here in Chicago. The way we're running the program is that we're using member leaders and stewards as the instructors and hold classes right at the work sites. I personally came into the program because safety is my number one priority, not just at my work, but all around. It's something I emphasize. I want everybody, no matter what job you have, to go home the exact same way that you came, that you came to work. Coming into the program, I'll be honest, I expected not a completely positive reaction from the members. As with my work site, we wouldn't have had a positive reaction, which is why it's important that we have member leaders because we're able to actually relate everything that the program actually has in a manner in which the students could understand our fellow members. Um, I don't believe that professional instructors would be able to relate to them as we do. The members have mentioned how they appreciate that we do the same work that they do on the same scale that they do. We know how there are many places in the buildings that the janitors are really the only ones that ever lay eyes on. And because we do, they do, we've had amazing reactions and um, an amazing reception from the participants. Uh, one of those reactions was actually uh, when we were going through how single stream recycling works and how many 
actual trucks it takes to get everything to the final destination. Like, who's paying for all that diesel? And that that's not something that they would most of our members would actually feel comfortable with if they were in a classroom setting with instructors. Then we had members in the very first class that didn't even realize that they worked in green buildings, let alone LEED certified buildings, which both of the buildings that we work at are, even though they had green certified patches on their uniforms. Uh, as the member leaders and instructors, we've had wonderful opportunities. So I wanna close out by saying that, well, uh, so one of the opportunities is we got to visit the Stickney water plant right here in Chicago, which is the largest uh, water reclamation building or site in the world. I wanna close out by saying that it's not just the students that are getting things out of it, out of the classes, but every one of the instructors is learning from the materials, learning how to become better leaders and learning how to speak publicly and do better for the environment. Thank you everyone for your time. Thanks Roberto and Monica. I'm so glad that you could participate today and hear from you. Like Roberto, our next speaker is also a member, a rank and file member and an instructor in um, the 32BJ training school. So uh, super happy that Marat Ulfir can um, join us today and share a little bit um, about the Green Building Superintendent Program, which is um, uh, trained over 3,000 residential building workers in energy efficiency. And Marat not only is instructor, but is his and a member, um, but also his kids are into climate too. Go for it, Marat. Thank you so much, everyone, for having me today. I'll tell you a story about myself. So uh, I came to this country from Ukraine in 1995. And thanks to my father, I was lucky enough to find a job as a handyman for a nonprofit, non-union organization. Back then I was making about $9 an hour. My son was born and the money was tough. So I needed a second job. I was lucky enough to find a part-time job in Queens building as a cleaner, porter. I took the position and I couldn't believe it. A union at that time was paying $16 an hour. I said, it's unfair. I'm a handyman, you know, more qualified, paying less. So no brainers. I joined the union back in 1996 and I'm in the union now for 26 years. I started at the bottom. It was a nice building. It was uh, I was making good living, uh, large stuff. And I see like one of the uh, cleaner was retiring. He worked there for 40 years. And I think not, not something I can do it for 40 years. And moreover, one of the employees uh, said that one of the cleaners actually went to school, 32 BJ, take all the classes and become a super in the city. I said, well, that's, that's probably gonna be me. So uh, I went to school, I took all the classes, I get all the possible uh, you know, certificates and stuff like that. And the funny thing, I don't know why my first class was OSHA. I was sitting next to one of the super said, is it easy you know, to take the, uh, and get the building? He said, it's not that easy, but you gotta either get the connections or you gotta be, uh, uh, you know, get all the licenses. Said, Again, that is me, uh, I gonna get all the licenses. So a few years passed by, like also took me almost six years. I get all the classes again and become resident manager too. I got all the diplomas. Uh, my family and I was expecting second child and I was thinking like one bedroom is not gonna be enough. So we need a little bit bigger, bigger room, bigger place. And uh, I was about ready you know, to get my building. So my first building guys, no experience was 750 apartments, condominium in Coney Island. So the way I become a superintendent, the board actually was uh, looking in the green super. We didn't have the green name at that time at that time, but they want me to reduce the electricity and the gas consumption. Somehow the water bills not their concern at that time because we're in a fixed rate. The kind of they didn't care uh, how much we use more or less is still going to be the same uh, rate. However, I learned myself, if I save cold water, so I'm gonna save electricity. If I save hot water consumption, I'm gonna save electricity and gas as well, you know? So my goal, my promise to the board, gonna say, I guarantee you, just give me the try and I'll save you 10% gas, uh, electricity, and my promise for myself, 10% of water consumption as well. So, uh, 
I had the union training, but I needed something else. I was looking for a green training. And luckily back then, at the same time, the city did the study and find out that about 70% from New York City comes from greenhouse emissions from the buildings. The city had goals to reduce the greenhouse emission and their research showed that the building operation and maintenance are critical means by which we can impact building energy, gas, oil, and water consumption. The city was needed a program which will train building operators to be much greener. This is how our 32BJ Green Super Program was born. The union received almost $3 million in grants to educate us, the union employees, I went back to school and uh, now my job in performance was depending on, on it and the results. So the board wanted me to reduce the gas electricity and the city was hoping that I can do more for the city, for the community, for everybody else. So September 2009 was the first class. I was one of the first students. Uh, many building operators, including myself, who had the same goals, went to school. In class, they were not only the supers, who want you know, to achieve something else, also was handyman, porter, doorman, concierge, anyone who wanted to advance themselves because we opened to a, a, everyone at that particular you know, training. The training fund's original goal was to train over 2,000 multifamily building service workers in two years. Create a green building plan to help supers and their team implement green changes in their buildings track changes workers make in their buildings and document the savings that result. They want to get the proof that yes, we spend the money and here is actually uh, the money was placed good. Uh, make large scale industry wide impact. All green participants receive the following training, building science, lighting, HVAC, indoor air quality, water conservation, quality engineering, creating green building plan, best practices to operate and maintain a building. Hundreds of supers got their training. I was lucky enough to be one of the first one who earned the green diploma. And I also received an award from the union by doing so much stuff in my building and having proven record. I also earned lots of industry certification, including lead AP on operation and maintenance. Moreover, the training fund helped me to dramatically achieve electricity and gas reduction in my building. The board could not believe it that after my advanced lighting class, I was able to bring Conet, our energy you know, supplier to the building and they replace all lights, almost 500 apartments free of charge. You know, at that time I said, how you can do free lights? I said, here you go. That's what union and school helped me. The board also could not believe it that uh, just besides pipe insulation, simple maintenance on the vacuum tank, steam traps are gonna help me to save dramatically on gas consumption. And that was the plan. That was the actually achievements and they can compare last year to this year. They couldn't believe, wow, you know, we're glad, you know, that was <laughs> took the place. I learned that saving on the gas and water makes my, uh, you know, my superintendent lives much easier because the equipment works much less, break down less, and it's easier, you know, to be in a stress-free environment in the building. My green achievements lead uh, me also to, to the first green award uh, from 32BJ and I was honored uh, at, that, at that note. However, the city wanted to be sure that their investment money in 32BJ uh, school paid off. A third uh, party company, Stephen Winter Associates Energy Engineers, performed a measurement and a verification study and program. They benchmarked 43 buildings and conducted 32 superintendent interviews. So 92% of superintendents implement energy conservation and achieve the same what I've achieved. Almost 1,000 members were called after they completed the training and 64% reported making green upgrades to the buildings. Hey, Mara, can you um, wrap up? We're a little yes. bit behind. Yes, a few more seconds. Few more, it's I'm so exciting sorry. exciting to hear from you, but um, we want to get to our next presenter too. As Thanks. of today, almost 2,000 building operators complete the training. Most of them earned you know, uh, certificates like I, BPI, and um, lead total impact seven, over 1700 buildings and over 300 employees send their buildings operated to train school on the company time. So 
on the end, what I got, uh, they actually program helped me to get lots of retrofits in my management buildings. I also helped me to get a job and better building in Manhattan. And together with the school, I was able to achieve dramatic, you know, savings on all the um, energy, water, and conservation. Thank you so much. And sorry, it took longer. That's all right. It's exciting uh, to hear from you. And um, Mara is, is a humble person. He also teaches at the school. And so he is also a member instructor like Roberto. Um, our net, and we're, um, we are running a little bit long. We hope everybody can stay and hear the next presentation, um, which is from our brothers and sisters of USWW in California. So um, Jane and um, Jovan, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to see everyone. Uh, we just wanted to tell you about our fight fighting the expansion of the Los Angeles airport. Um, you can go ahead and put our slides up um, and you can go to the next one. So I think we have a lot of airport workers on this call. What we know we have in the airport industry is, you know, a greedy industry that makes lots and lots of money, exploiting workers, poverty jobs. Uh, we have non-union airports all over the country, and it's actually our union's number one priority campaign this year to bring airport jobs into the union and to raise standards for airport workers. Uh, but at the same time that we have poverty jobs, we also have a horrible climate impact and impact on our health. And in fact, if you look at the airline industry and you look at climate plans from the companies or from the government or even the international climate plans, no one has a plan to deal with the emissions from airlines. And what you see here is that the emissions from airlines are just supposed to increase and increase and increase at the same time as air pollution is getting worse and worse. And, you know, our climate, uh, it, you know, is getting scarier and scarier what's happening with our climate. Um, so that's what we confronted with the airline industry. You can go to the next one in the middle of this. We saw that the Los Angeles airport was going to expand. So is that what we need at a time when we have more and more climate change, more and more air pollution, is even more of it, and right in the middle of the black and brown neighborhoods of South Los Angeles? No, right? So we saw a threat here. Uh, these airlines were Southwest had just gone non-union at LAX. They were going to expand, potentially bringing in more and more non-union jobs, uh, but also there was going to be more and more health impacts on our communities. So that's when we sprang into action. Uh, and um, we're going to show the next slide, the video, and then I'll turn it over to Javon to talk a little bit about more about what we did. The neighborhood I live in now, it's both black and brown. It's a like family oriented neighborhood. Like I know everybody on this road. So we're in a house of seven in a two bedroom. Myself, my son, niece, and uh, four other kids. We can't afford a bigger apartment on my income. Recently I was diagnosed with uh, COPD. It's a lung condition where uh, related to smokers and I don't smoke, so I'm like, you know, how did I get this? And he was like, you know, where do you work? And I told him, and he was like, oh, well, that's how you got it. I have to work here and work for so little pay, but then in the long run, I'm, I'm getting sick. My son has asthma, my mom has bronchitis. I usually put him on a, like a nebulizer and give him breathing treatments when that happens. The expansion makes me feel upset. I don't think they care at all. They don't live here, so they don't see. They have to land, so they have to dump fuel. When I looked at the map of where they could have dumped the fuel, ocean or the mountains of Calabasas, and they had all those other areas, but they dumped it right here because they really don't care about black and brown people. It's going to get a lot worse. The pollution is going to get a lot worse. The you know the noise is going to get a lot worse. I already don't sleep that good as it is, and you know, um, there's billions and billions of dollars coming out of LAX. We need better health care. We need better jobs. We need better wages, better education. 
for these communities. Eric Garcetti and LA City Council, you can't rush this project. Our quality of life really matters. I'm already sick, my son's already sick, my neighbors, communities are already sick. What do you think that's gonna happen when this expansion happens? Hello, everyone. Um, like I'm, like I said, um, I'm Javon Houston. Um, I have interpreters. I hear an interpreter. Um, so it first kicked off um, our fight with the dumping of fuel in Cudahy. Um, it's uh, a little bit outside of Southern California, uh, where they dump fuel on an elementary school, which was not too far from my son's school. And it greatly impacted um, the students there. Um, there were all kind of incidents where the kids were hospitalized. And at the same time they were dumping fuel, um, they introduced the LAX expansion, um, which would mean more planes coming back and forth in our neighborhoods. Um, and we put two and two together and we're like, hey, if they're dumping fuel there, they're dumping fuel in our neighborhoods. So we had scientists, um, do a study and see how the air pollution were affecting us here in Southern California. And it, it was horrible. Um, so then we, you know, we got together with a, a committee um, to introduce um, this expansion to our members. Um, we spoke to media, we shared my story that you saw. Um, we met with, uh, other organizations like Sunrise Movement, um, Jane Fonda's uh, Climate Pact. We spoke to her. We had uh, several protests in front of Lawa um, where we were outside of their building yelling, like, you know, you're hurting our workers. Um, we spoke to council, city council members. Um, we had hearings where we couldn't be there present because of COVID, but we had hundreds of our members calling in. Um, we had several rallies where we walked the entire airport, you know, uh, Southwest, United, you know, telling them that they need to consider our workers for their health. Um, we had, uh, the most impactful time was when we had community outreach where we were in the streets of, uh, Southern California, and we had these big, huge signs basically saying um, LAX is polluting us. And we were surprised how many people in the community came over to us and was like, what is this about? And they, they weren't educated at all about what LAX does to our communities. And they were shocked. And many of them signed on and you know, gave us their phone numbers and email addresses. Just say, you know, yes, I'm, I'm in this fight and I'll join you guys. Um, so that really, you know, touched me. And so um, with all that hard work, you know, Jane's gonna share um, what we want out of all of this. Okay. Okay, Thanks. so really quickly, Jane, cause we're a little over, um, but if you could uh, do this part really quickly. Sure, and you can just run through the next of our slides uh, one by one so folks can see them. Um, so, you know, with all of what Jovan said, you know, the really most transformational thing for us was to make space for our members to think about the environmental impact that they've been living and working with their whole lives, right? And to see that the impact of that environmental racism on themselves. Um, we were not able to completely stop the expansion of the airport. I think folks have seen that in our airport campaign across the country. These airlines are very powerful, uh, but we were able to make, win some major victories. And what we won was better environmental policies at the airport. We really made a difference around air pollution for the first time, which was very exciting. And we also won on, for workers, a commitment from these airlines to go back to union jobs and to enforce labor laws at the airport. So it was a win for both because we took on those issues together. And we're not stopping there. We're going to continue taking on the airlines in 
California, hold them accountable for their climate and air pollution. Right now, California law lets them off the hook completely. They do not regulate or tax jet fuel. Um, we're going to change that in the years to come, and we're going to continue to organize around the health impacts for, you know, with our members at the airport and around the airports in California. Thanks, Jane, and thank you, Joan. You know, it's so incredible to hear from amazing member leaders like Roberto Marat and you, Jovan, and so many of the other folks who are on the call today. It's, I'm so proud to be part of SEIU, um, a union that really supports and develops member leaders to take on struggles at, in the workplace, in the community, and for justice. And um, this is just the tip of the ice, iceberg. I know folks wanna, may want to stay on and you know, hear more or have questions. If you do have a question or a comment, please put it in the chat. We're really interested in hearing from you and getting your feedback um, and thinking about um, what you liked about this breakout, what you liked about the whole uh, summit, the whole conference, the whole plenary session so that as we move forward, we continue to do things that work and we learn from the things that um, maybe didn't work so well. And we ran over a little bit because there's so much to share and we have so much to talk about. Um, and there, there's incredible work going on in local unions throughout the United States, Canada and Puerto Rico. We're really proud of that. We wanna lift that work up. And we also have some national work that we're doing. So as, you know, in addition to the work we're doing in our local communities or in our states or inside of our local unions, we're also doing work nationally as part of SEIU. And um, we need to do our part to make sure that to, to uh, stop climate change, to reduce the impact of climate change. And over the next year, the Biden administration will be issuing more than a dozen rules to curb pollution especially in communities of color that will help us reach that goal. We need to bring the power of all of the SEIU 2 million members uh, into this effort and build a response network of members committed to sending comments to the EPA Environmental Protection Agency and engaging in local actions. In the chat and on the screen, you'll see a link and a QR code to sign up for info. So. Um, Click on the link, scan the QR code uh, so that you can be informed about what's going on. And um, please put co any comments or thoughts or uh, ideas that you have, suggestions that you have in the chat. Let's see what's going on in the chat right now. So everybody should be encouraging people to click on the QR code get involved with your local union, sign up for alerts and um, give you a couple more minutes to put things in the chat. We appreciate everybody's participation today and all of the 64 of you who have hung, hung in through this uh, breakout. We appreciate you, the work that you do and encourage you to continue to stay in the struggle for environmental justice. Okay, give a couple more minutes. I see some, uh, a few comments in. Okay, it's, imp it's an important issue. And let's see what else, who else has got a, a comment here? Any other thoughts or reflections on, on the program today? Air, okay. I say that we keep programs more, let's see, Im important. Uh, this is an important theme. I'm all in, great to see that, great to hear that. Okay, SEIU family, appreciate everybody joining with us today, staying through the whole thing. Love to hear more. Can't wait to meet some of you who I haven't met yet. The USWW video is awesome and amazing. And it's great to hear about all the work that's going on. And from every SEIU local, from every member, 
Um, we need you in this movement. Um, and want to also appreciate Euron for, uh, I think, zooming in from her vacation to uh, participate. Unfortunately, we don't have time for the networking session, but um, we hope that everybody will stay connected. Appreciate you. And we'll see you at the next summit or some sometime before then. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Maybe you can unmute. Everybody can unmute yourself. Thanks, everyone. You have a big SEIU. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. When we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. When we fight, we win. Okay, okay, cuando ganamos, ganamos. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody, enjoy the weekend. Have a good weekend. Gracias. Gracias. Okay, awesome. And for the interpreters, we are now done. Thank you, interpreters. We appreciate you too. Muchas gracias por este tema tan importante para todos y todas. Yeah, to the interpreters, I, I'm sorry if I spoke too fast. So, Sharit, Lenore, Jason, could you just stay on for a minute? You're on. All right, people still want to stay on. That's amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I there's can been tell good you. energy, everybody, today. So, yeah. can we keep the recording going? No, I think we can cut it off now. Thank you. All right, I'll stop it now. <laughs>